Hey guys and gals, Vlad here with EVT Astro and today as always I've got an interesting astro topic for you guys. For those of you that might not be familiar, I run a little astro blog called avt-astro.com and of course this YouTube channel, so if you're not subscribed please do consider subscribing. Um, over the last uh, 25 years or so I've had the privilege of owning over 100 scopes, more accessories than I could count. Uh, which kind of brings us to uh, the topic of this video. I'm primarily a visual observer, as you can see. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so I, you know, I wanted to make this video because uh, this is, you know, at the recording of this video, it's January right now, you know, a bunch of people got their first telescope or maybe you upgraded your telescope, you know, and maybe you've looked at the moon, the sun, or not the sun, um, well, maybe the sun with the, the appropriate filter. You do need a filter for that one. <laughs> uh, but the moon, the planets, uh, maybe, you know, some of the brighter stars or whatnot. Maybe you've already looked at a couple of brighter deep sky objects. But I wanted to give you guys uh, a list of uh, 10 uh, objects that I love to observe every season. Uh, they're kind of my favorites. Most of these I could locate, you know, kind of from memory these days. All right. Anyway, now that I'm energized with coffee, we are going to start in winter because at the making of this video, again, this is winter. Um, I'm going to start with probably the best deep sky object in the night sky, and that is M42 the Great Orion Nebula in Orion. So I'm posting the picture right now. If you've never seen this object, you're in for a real treat. This thing is bright enough to easily see with your unaided eye, with your naked eye from a dark sky sight. Um, you know, you'll see like kind of like a faint glow. You could very easily see with any binoculars. Um, and any telescope, you know, even if you got like an entry level, you know, like, um, 60 to 80 millimeter refractor like a little tabletop daub you know you'll be in for a real treat i mean the the you're not gonna see you know what the picture looks like that i posted in uh but you'll be in you know pretty amazed at how much detail you could see on this one one thing to look out for this one is the trapezium basically there's a uh, essentially a cluster in right in the middle of the nebula and the nebula is basically just a cloud of gas, if you're not familiar. But anyway, um, right at the center of us, so check that out. It's very easy to see. Four stars are very easy to see. Um, depending on your telescope and your scene conditions, you could actually see uh, up to six stars, um, you know, decently easy. But the, the other two are kind of, you know, tougher. All right, moving on. Um, open cluster M37. This is a favorite of mine. Um, very cool open cluster. If you're not familiar with open clusters, it's basically a, you know kind of like a loose gathering of stars. Um, but you know they're they're packed uh, tightly enough to where you know they kind of look cool. This is where the wide field scope shines. So even if you have like a little 60 millimeter refractor, uh, use your wide field eyepiece. You'll essentially see kind of like a little peppering of stars. Very cool. I mean, it probably won't look as impressive as uh, the image that I posted in. Um, unless you're at a dark sky, then it, it, it might. So open clusters are one of those things that sometimes, I mean, actually a lot of times, depending on how dark your sky is and the, depending on the type of telescope you use, they could actually look better visually than they do in astrophotography. So that's really cool. All right, so this one, the next one is a real treat. So the double cluster um, in Perseus, uh, and this is NGC 864 and 869. Man, this is a real treat. So another uh, one of those open clusters, except there's two of them. It's essentially a pair of open clusters right by each other. These are, you know, pretty dense. They kind of almost look like a really, or like two really loose uh, globular clusters, really cool. Uh, there's also a orange star, I don't know the name of it, but in the field of view, so look out for that. So, you know, it's one of the uh, more colorful stars. So that's really cool. I think that one's a carbon star too. If you're not familiar with carbon stars, look them up, they're pretty cool. All right, next object, M31. All right, so this thing, um, by the way, like in the little descriptions, I'm listing the size of the objects. So, uh, for, you know, for, for reference, the full moon, right, the diameter of the moon, it's about half a degree, right? So um, these objects, you know, like, like for instance, M31, I mean, this thing spans three degrees, okay? So, I mean, think about that. If the full moon is half a degree, 
This thing is three degrees in the sky. I mean, huge, huge, huge. This is another one of those objects you can pretty easily see with your unaided eye. If you're at a dark sky site, it'll kind of look like a little, you know, glow. And actually, nebula, I think it's in Latin. It does mean cloud, basically. So, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, it does kind of look like a glow in the sky uh, through a telescope. You'll definitely see that central region. If you're at a dark enough sky and your scope, you know, if you've got a pretty good uh, wide field, let's say like Apple or something like that, you could even see uh, a couple of the dark lanes in it. You could see the satellite galaxy. This is a really neat object. I mean, you could really spend hours on this one, just kind of looking for details and that type of deal in it. So very cool, M31. All right, next one up is the Blue Snowball Nebula. So this is the first one that we get to that's a planetary nebula. And essentially a planetary nebula, um, as the name implies, it kind of looks almost like a dim planet, essentially, because most of them are round. Um, uh, but they, re they really don't have anything to do with planets, uh, besides, you know, kind of looking like, you know, a planet through a telescope. Essentially what it is, is it's actually a star that kind of released its outer envelopes. Uh, it didn't per se blow up, but if you want to think about it that way, you can think about it that way. It released its outer envelopes of gas, and actually our sun is, you know, destined for a similar fate in uh, billions of years, so don't lose any sweat. But anyway, so blue snowball, as the name implies, it is blue. Uh, the blue color is fairly easy to see. If you have anything that's, let's say, like a five inch or above, um, you should really be able to see the blue color fairly easily. Use higher powers on uh, planetary nebulas. Don't be afraid to use your highest power eyepiece. If the season is, scene is decent, you'll be able to see more colors. But the thing to look out for the, uh, with this one um, is that really blue color. And that one is an Andromeda, by the way, constellation wise. All right, next up we have M45. The Pleiadesi Star Cluster. Man, I mean, this one, so I mentioned, some of the other ones you can see visually. I mean, this one, you can't mistake in it. And, you know, like I have, most of my friends and family, they're not into astronomy at all, unfortunately. Um, sometimes, you know, I take the, you know, I, I, I got to drag them out and show them stuff in the sky though, right? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, when we're out in the sky, uh, you know, they'll see it and be like, oh, look, there's the little dipper, because it looks like a little dipper. It doesn't really have anything to do with the Little Dipper. Uh, Ursa Minor is you know, usually referred to as the Little Dipper, but it does look like it. Uh, really cool cluster. Um, you could, you know, even the visual looks really cool. Through a small telescope, it's really awesome. You'll see, you know, uh, the seven, the brightest stars in it. If you're at a really dark sky site, if you have an excellent contrast apo, you can even see some of the nebulosity visually. I've seen it many times. Uh, the scene, or not the scene, the transparency and the sky darkness has to be very excellent though to see it visually. Uh, but it is possible. I've seen it uh, down to uh, um, five inch apples, you know, pretty easily. Seven inch does a little better though. <laughs> All right, anyhow, uh, moving on. So. Now uh, we're kind of down to the challenge objects. So the last three objects in the list are kind of more challenging objects. They're not really like all that challenging though. You know, some of them are harder to find, some of them are dimmer, but these are really cool objects that I really enjoy observing. Again, I observe all of these like every season. So uh, we get to uh, M1, their first misery object, the Crab Nebula. This one, um, as the picture, you know, shows, it does have a lot of detail visually, though. All that detail is really hard to see. I mean, I've seen hints of it in really big scopes. Uh, you're probably just going to see, like, a glow in the sky. Uh, but this is a cool object, though. The pictures on this one do honestly look way better than it does, you know, look visually. Uh, so, yeah, but that's a cool object, though. All right, next up, Caroline's Rose. This is a really cool open cluster that, I, you know, I kind of, like, I I discovered it fairly recently. I, I probably discovered it, I don't know, like, six, seven years ago. And when I say discovered it, I saw it on the Star Atlas, and I was like, why haven't I never seen it? So I pointed the scope. Really cool object. Um, this one looks really good from a dark sky. Um, it's an open star cluster of many, many stars that are about the same uh, magnitude. Um, this one in real life does look better than, you know, like in pictures to me, definitely. 
Uh, white field is what you're after, so use your white whitest field eyepiece, um, and you know, preferably you know, observe it from the dark sky. Very cool object, though. All right, and then next up, we get to uh, the little dumbbell nebula in Perseus. Um, and later we'll get to the big, the actual dumbbell nebula. But anyway, so the little dumbbell nebula, this is a really cool object. It's smaller than the actual dumbbell. Uh, looks, you know, roughly the same. If you have a dark sky site, a larger scope, look for the outer envelope of gas. They, you know, you can kind of see in the picture. And this is a picture that I actually took with the AA myself. Um, very, very cool object. Uh, this one does respond really well to light pollution filters. So if you have like an O3 filter, you know, by all means use that. It does help out as you know a lot with this one. All right, so that kind of concludes the winter. Let's jump into the spring. Our right, first couple of objects we have is M81 and M82. Those are two galaxies. One is kind of an irregular galaxy. Uh, it's called a cigar galaxy usually, um, and you could totally easily see the cigar shape even in a small telescope. And the other one is a, um, a regular galaxy, basically with spider arm, or not spider, spiral arms coming out of it and stuff like that. So similar to like our galaxy or uh, M31, the one that, you know, we kind of talked about earlier. This is actually an image that I took. It's probably my best astrophotography picture. I'm not that big of an astrophotographer, but I was proud of that one. It's like 14 hours of exposure, okay? <laughs> from a really dark uh, Bordel 1 uh, dark sky site in Central Oregon from a few years ago. If you're curious and you're bored, check out my blog. I actually have a write-up about that trip. Um, all right, so anyway, those are a pair. You can not see them, by the way, I should say, in the same field of view with, you know, even a moderate power eyepiece. But, uh, you know, try a bunch of different powers because these two galaxies do respond really well. They look great at low power. They'll look really good at high power, especially the Cigar Galaxy. It does have a lot of graniation and like molting in it to where you could see detail, especially if you have like an 8 inch or above telescope. You could definitely see a lot of detail from the dark sky site, uh, the kind of like, you know, more regular galaxy. It, uh, you can't see the spiral structure as well. It, it's You do have to have excellent transparency for that, though, so that's a little bit tougher. All right, moving on, M44 in Cancer. This is a, one of the best uh, open star clusters out there. Just many, many bright stars. Looks amazing through pretty much any telescope. This is another object that if you're at dark sky say you can't see visually, so really cool. All right, so moving on, Eskimo Nebula. This is one of my favorites. Um. So, the reason that it's called an Eskimo is, I'll actually post in the Hubble Space Telescope image of it right now. It's supposed to look kind of like the face of an Eskimo, I mean, I don't know. Uh, but it is a really cool object. If you have a larger scope, you use very high power. You can't see the central star very easily in this one. And you can see, you know, several of the kind of like rings, you know, associated with it. If you have like a really good scope, if you have dark skies, you use like, you know, the highest power that you have if the scene is good, you could actually see granulations. I mean, this this is one of those objects that it's really bright and it does show a lot of detail with high power. So high power is your friend here, especially if you have a larger scope. Really cool object. I really enjoy this one. It looks really good with EAA if you do EAA. Man, crank that sucker up, you know, like uh, use the biggest scope you have. And yeah, you'll see a lot of detail in them. All right, so M65, M66, and NGC3628 in Leo. This is another astrophotography image that I took myself. Uh, this one sometimes referred to as the Leo Triplet, you know, three galaxies essentially. Uh, use low power, looks really awesome visually to see all three of the galaxies. They're all, you know, kind of different too, so it's kind of like a galaxy sampler. So yeah, check it out. Um, you can, you know, see the difference in shapes even through a small telescope. If you have a bigger scope from a darker sky, you can see some of the details in them as well. So this, you know, these are all kind of brighter galaxies. All right, so M35. Um, this is a really cool, this is another open cluster, and this one is in Gemini as well. Um, Really big, really bright open cluster. It kind of almost reminds me a little bit of a globular, like a really uh, loose globular cluster. Uh, what's really cool about this one is that it has another cluster right by it, which is NGC 2158, which is 
I really dim open clusters. So if you have a bigger scope uh, from a dark sky say, or even if you have, you know, like a smaller refractor, you know, check it out. The same conditions are awesome. You might be able to spot the second uh, little open cluster. It's like really like a really cool contrast to see the two, you know, clusters. The smaller cluster, it's much further away. It's much dimmer. Uh, it's almost kind of like a shadow of the big cluster though. So it's really cool, you know, really kind of cool effect from a dark sky site. Oh, all right, get into one of my all time favorite. This is probably my favorite galaxy, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy and Ursa Major. This one, you know, really awesome. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, the bigger scope you have with this one, the better. Um, basically, if you're at a dark sky site though, look for the spi I want to say spider arms again, spiral arms. Uh, they're pretty obvious. If you have it say an eight inch or above, you have a very good shot of you know seeing them. If you have a good quality refractor that's let's say even like down to 80 millimeters, you might still be able to see them from a dark sky site though. But the bigger scope, the better. Um, you can see the bridge between the two galaxies visually. I mean, it won't look quite as good as it does in the picture. And this is actually an EAA picture that I took with my 12-inch advanced coma free. Uh, but man, I mean, from a dark sky site, especially with the larger scope, let's say if you have like 12 inch or above, I mean, it, it really starts to look, you know, really similar to the picture though. So really, really cool object. Lots of detail. We'll spend some time on this one. There's a lot to see with them. <clears throat> All right, so now we get to M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. This one is a really another cool galaxy. Uh, this is in Coma Bersinius. So basically, um, the galaxy itself, you know, it's pretty bright, pretty uh, pretty concentrated, so uh, I, you, you should be able to see it fairly easily in any telescope. Uh, what's really cool though is if you're at a dark sky site uh, with the bigger scope, it's easier, but even a smaller scope should be able to show it. Uh, it's got like a very distinct, you know, black region, which is essentially, I think it's a dark nebula in there. <clears throat> Very, very cool effect from a dark sky say This one, the bigger the scope, the better as well. Actually, with most galaxies, it's true, but it's, you know, especially this one. Use higher powers. Uh, higher power does definitely help you bring out the dark, you know, the black eye. <clears throat> All right, had to get a little power up. All right, moving on. So now we get kind of to the challenge object. And on this one, you know, it's kind of challenging. The Owl Nebula and Ursa Major. This is M97. You know, seeing the nebula itself, it's probably not too tough if you're at a darker site. If you're from the city, uh, use an O3 filter really will help out. Um, crank up the power and see if you could actually see the two eyes that, you know, you could see in the picture. But this is a really cool object. Um, you know, it's a planetary nebula, so it looks, you know, pretty much round. Uh, but the, the central star is actually pretty easy in this one. It's not true about all nebulas. Uh, but the two eyes, you know, they're kind of like, that's what makes it challenging to me. I know I to see those. Uh, I'd say if you have a 12 inch or above from a darker site, it should be, you know, fairly easy to do. Um, also, in those wide field scopes, look out for M108. Uh, it's a galaxy that's hanging out right by. You should be able to fit them in the same wide field of view. All right, so now moving on in Virgo, we are to Martarian's chain. So uh, M86 is uh, one of those galaxies, but it's essentially a string of galaxies as you see in the picture. Use wide field, you probably do need to be at a dark sky site to, you know, really kind of see all the galaxies in that. Um, you know, having a larger scope again does help with that, but really cool effect just to kind of see the whole string of galaxies. Um, if you don't have wide field, you can kind of just, you know, go from galaxy to galaxy, you know, like uh, kind of just keep on moving the field of view, but it's really cool to see them all at once though. So look out for that, really cool. All right, so now moving on, again, the Coma Bersinius, uh, NGC 4565, the Needle Galaxy. This is one of my favorites uh, as far as an edge on galaxy. So galaxies, you know, we could see them like this, right? To where um, kind of like M51, you know, you see the whole spiral structure or we could see them, you know, edge on. This is a really edge on galaxy. It's almost perfectly edge on to us from our perspective. So you just kind of see it, you know, from this direction, just looks like, a, you know, essentially a, a thin strip. This is a bright one though. It's a really cool one to check out. Again, Aperture does really help. I try to use higher powers too on this one. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool object to see. All right, so moving on. So we are done with the spring, moving on to summer.
All right, M13. This is definitely one of my favorite objects. I love globular clusters. By the way, I kind of mentioned globular clusters, didn't tell you what they are. Globular clusters are kind of like an open cluster, except they're much more concentrated. So the center of them, usually it's pretty hard to resolve. It'll just kind of look like a really bright glow. And then the out outside portions of them, well, you know, you'll kind of see individual stars. The picture that I posted in, that's actually an EAA stack that I did myself with the 12 inch meter advanced coma free. This is uh, from the Northern Hemisphere, the brightest globular cluster that you can see the, the most easiest to observe. A uh, really, really cool, spend some time on it. This is a really cool object. I mean, lots to see there. All right, get into M57. This is probably, well, it's one of my favorite planetary nebulas. Very bright, it's called the Rain Nebula. It does look like a rain through pretty much any telescope. If you have a larger scope with excellent conditions, I'd say probably um, you'll, you're probably gonna need like a 12 inch at least. Um, the first time I really definitively saw it was with an 18 inch to kind of give you an example. Uh, use high power if you have a larger scope. You should be able to see the central star in excellent scene. That's kind of the challenge for me with this one. Um, if you're at a really dark sky site, have a you know larger scope, you could actually even see a little. Like if your eyes are you know sensitive to color, you could actually see a little bit of color in it, like usually a little greenish. I've actually you know with my biggest scopes even seen some um, like on the outskirts of it some yellow. So this is one object that it is possible to see some color. All right, moving on to another um, planetary nebula, the Cat's Eye in Draco. This is a really bright one. Uh, with this one, I'm not gonna lie, the bigger scope you have, the better. Uh, use very high powers, uh, it does show quite a bit of detail. Um, it won't look as good as the picture. Um, and the object is small if you look at the size. So you really do need high power, which actually you actually kind of really need um, excellent scene uh, as well for it. Um, but you could definitely see some of that, you know, cat's eye type of detail. All right, so moving on, we got a couple of uh, uh, globular clusters as well. So M3 and M5, I'll just kind of talk about both of them. Alan. They're not uh, quite as good as um, M13 is, but they're very bright, very good uh, globular star clusters. So check them out. Very cool to see. Um, and what I like about uh, globular clusters, I like to kind of compare them. Like, so I'll look at M13 and then I'll look at, let's say, like M3 and just kind of compare the size, the distribution of them, you know, kind of how the stars are fanned out or arranged in them. So there's, you know, there's a lot to kind of see in them. All right, so the next one, it's kind of like a cheater object, but I have to put it on. Okay, it's not really a deep sky object. Uh, the double double star in uh, Lyra, <clears throat> you gotta check it out, okay? It's two, it's basically a double star that's really wide, right? <clears throat> but if you use um, moderate power, if you got a good scope, you could split the, you know, two individual pairs, even at like 100x. I've done it even at lower power. Uh, scene has to be good though to do that. But anyway, uh, two stars right by each other, and if you look at uh, each one, they're also a double star. Very, very, very cool object. <clears throat> so that was kind of my cheater object for the summer. Love it. You gotta see it. <laughs> All right, so uh, the next one is M92. And this is also in Hercules. That's another globular cluster. <clears throat> compare M13, compare M92. M92 is much smaller, but still a very interesting object. Uh, so that's a really cool one. All right, so moving on. So now we're on to the challenge object. So this was, uh, this this next one. You do have to have dark skies and you do have to have white fields, okay? So depending on the scope that you have, you know, it might be, you know, fairly easy or it might be really challenging. Uh, M101, so this one, you know, it's about half a degree in diameter, so about the same size as the moon or so. Uh, it's a face on a galaxy, so you could see uh, if you're at a dark sky, you have an awesome white field apple. Um, you could see kind of like the fan shape, lots of detail on it, but it is challenging. You have to have a dark sky and it has to be really good transparency. All right, so now uh, next up we have NGC 6210. This is another planetary nebula. Uh, big scope, high power equals actually quite a bit of detail that you could see even visually. So it won't look as good as the picture, but that's a really cool object to kind of check out. It is really small, so high power is required. All right, so now we get to uh, M102, and uh, this is another uh, really cool galaxy in Draco, so check that one out as well. 
I enjoyed that one. All right, so now we are to the fall objects, to the, to the last uh, season. So I'm not gonna lie, um, I really enjoy these objects. I don't observe them as often because you have to have a really good um, uh, view of the horizon to the south to see you know, the first kind of like batch of them. And they're in the Sagittarius region, so that's kind of looking towards the center of our galaxy. Uh, but if you are at a darker sky site, or really any site that has a good, uh, hopefully not light polluted view of the south, check these out. So M16, the Eagle Nebula. Um, I'm going to post on the Hubble Space Telescope an image from this one, because everybody's seen that probably. It's really cool. It's not going to look as good as uh, that visually, but it's a really cool object. Uh, this one responds really well to light pollution filters, so if you have like an O3 filter, use that. Uh, you'll see a lot of detail. Swan Nebula. This one actually does look like, like the Eagle Nebula doesn't really look like an Eagle team, but the Swan Nebula does look like a Swan team, okay? <laughs> and I think it's also called the Omega Nebula too, so, you know. But yeah, Swan, you can kind of see the body, you can see the neck, you could see, it actually more, it looks more like a duck because the neck isn't very long on it. Um, you can see the head, really cool object. If you have a bigger scope, dark sky, crank up the power on this one. There's lots and lots of details on this one. Okay, it's a brain nebula, crank up the power. And, you know, I do enjoy observing that at lower powers to where you can see the, you know, the whole thing. I mean, I've had this one up to like uh, like about 550x from a nice dark sky say with the larger scope. And man, the amount of detail that you can see, it's just, it's staggering with this one. So yeah, it's a really cool one. Lagoon Nebula, you know, as the name suggests, kind of looks like a lagoon, you know, in the ocean. Um, just a really nice bright nebula. Lots of details on this one too. Responds well to uh, filters, so use your O3 filter. All right, so now we get to, um, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. So this is, uh, you know, this is the bigger uh, version, the bigger brother to the little Dumbbell Nebula that we discussed earlier. It kind of has that dumbbell shape. Um, and that you should be able to see even from a light polluted sky. It, it does respond well to filters, so if you have a filter, use it. I, although, honestly, this one I prefer unfiltered for whatever reason. Um, so yeah. So check it out, you should be able to see that dumbbell shape. The central star is pretty easy in that. Now, if you're at the darker sky site, if you have a bigger scope, so you, you know, you see that, you know, kind of like the picture shows. So you see that dumbbell shape, right? But it also has, you know, kind of like an outer envelope going in the opposite direction. And you can see that visually. It has to be from a darker sky site. You don't necessarily have to have that huge of a telescope. You just have to have really awesome con uh, transparency and a really dark sky site to see that. Again, filters do help with that, but check it out both filtered and unfiltered, because this one I really do like unfiltered. Um, it does respond well to bigger scopes, so the bigger scope, the better. <clears throat> All right, so this one's kind of a treat. So the Blinking Planetary Nebula in Cygnus, which is NGC 20, or 6826. This one is a really cool one. Now, this this one has that name, you know, like kind of, kind of like the common name of it. There's other nebulas that kind of have this effect, but basically what's cool about it is the central star is pretty bright, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, so when you look at the nebula, right, it just kind of looks, you know, similar to the rain nebula, except this is just kind of more of like a sphere though. It doesn't really have a very strong ring uh, shape to it. Um, but when you look at the central star, right, you'll kind of see that the nebulosity starts to disappear. It's a really cool effect, like, you know, and you can just keep on doing So then when you look away from the central star, you'll kind of, the nebulosity will pop into view. So it's a really cool effect, check it out. Um, <clears throat> I, even a high power visual, I haven't seen too much detail on that. So you don't necessarily need, you know, to have crazy high power. Like even at 100X, you should be able to see that blinking effect. That's kind of like my favorite part about that one. <clears throat> All right, so getting on to M11 and uh, Skirdum, the wild duck cluster. As the name suggests, it's supposed to look like a wild duck. Uh, to me, like, I don't know, like, I guess if I use my imagination, it kind of looks like that. But just a really cool, bright, open cluster. Uh, this one you could also see visually from a dark sky site. Um, it is fairly large. It's, you know, about the size of the moon. Uh, so, yeah, check it out. Really, really cool. Really, really bright star cluster. All right, so now getting on to, this is not a really common one. So if you're like reading introductory astronomy books or whatever, it's not in a lot of the list, but I really enjoy this object. It's called the Kohaner. Guess what it looks like? 
a coat hanger. <laughs> so this one you can actually probably see in binoculars. It's huge. It's uh, almost a degree. Uh, so you want to definitely use low power. Um, if you know if you've got a higher power scope, let's say if you have a C8 and you don't have an eyepiece that can fit the whole thing, uh, you could even use your finder scope. You know, like let's see even if you have a 30 millimeter, you should be able to see the coat hanger shape in it. So I really enjoy this one. It's kind of a fun object for me. Um, I don't even know if it's an open, like an actual, like if the stars are associated with or if they're just kind of arranged like that. I guess I should have looked that up. But cool object there. All right. So now we're uh, down to the last three challenge objects. The Saturn Nebula. So remember how I said that, you know, like they're called planetary nebulas because they kind of look like plants because a lot of them are round. You know, not all of them. Like the dumbbell, like you want to like mistaken that hopefully for a planet. But, you know, like the rain nebula through a small telescope kind of looks like a planet. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this one's called the Saturn Nebula. Guess why? It looks like Saturn. <laughs> but anyway, this one's really cool. So it's got like that central, you know, portion that it kind of has around. But it also has like, you know, kind of like radiating that velocity and actually with like kind of two lumps at the ends. So it kind of looks like the rings of Saturn. Um, to me, I think this one's appropriately named. You know, I think, you know, if, if like, let's say if you're looking at Saturn through a really low scope, through like some cloud, through a really small scope, I mean, through some clouds, it might look like this nebula. So it's pretty cool. I like it. Check it out. Uh, again, high powers do work well in this. All right, so now we get to the Veil Nebula. This is an interesting object. Okay? This is an object you can spend all night observing because there's just so much of it. So this thing is huge, 300 arc minutes. Okay, so this is actually a planetary nebula. It just happens to be really close to us. It's essentially a huge ring structure, right? There's a eastern portion of it and the western portion of it that are, refer you know, that are commonly referred to. There's a bunch of nebulosity in the middle. If you happen to own a 70, like a 60, 70 or 80 millimeter wide field Apple and you have the right eyepiece, you could actually observe the whole nebula in one field of view. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, now, so okay, so this nebula, you for sure, if you have an O3 filter, you for sure want to use that. Like a lot of nebulas I enjoy without filters, this one you really kind of almost need an O3 filter really kind of increases the contrast with this one burns out the nebula. So if you have a smaller scope, the right eyepiece, and I mean, by the right eyepiece, I mean like a really wide field eyepiece, like a 31 millimeter Nagler or, you know, like a 40 millimeter 68 degree or something like that. Uh, so you can see the whole thing. It's really cool. Um, if you have a larger scope, you're not going to be able to fit the whole thing because it's three degrees across, you know. Um, so basically, yeah, so check it out. If you have a larger scope, you could use higher power and you could just kind of zoom around the nebula, you know, and just kind of check out, you know, different sections of it. So basically, the bigger the scope, you'll see more detail. The smaller the scope, the more you could see at once. Very, very cool object though. O3 filter is almost, I'd say, like a must for it. But if you don't have one, still check it out. All right, and this is kind of getting to the last object on our list. Uh, NGC 40. This is another planetary nebula. It's a very red one. The color on this is possible visually to kind of, you know, eke out. Not really easy because the red our eyes are not very sensitive to red, but it is possible to kind of eke it out if you have a larger scope from a dark sky site. A lot of detail with this one. So you can kind of like, as you saw in the picture, there's like the kind of like tentacle type of things that come out. So check it out. Very, very cool object. Alrighty guys, so that kind of concludes the list. Hopefully you guys found this video informative. Um, I encourage you, check out some of these objects. You will not be disappointed. This is some of the brightest, coolest looking stuff in the night sky. Now, this is kind of like my favorite ones that I observe, you know, from year in and year out. This isn't the only ones. There's, a, you know, like lots of other, you know, bright uh, deep sky objects. But I'd say these are really good ones to start with with pretty much any telescope. So anyhow, if you guys have any questions, comments, or anything like that, leave them in the thing below. If you're not subscribed, again, please do consider subscribing. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.